Okay, we're going to read out of John 19, verse 31 to 42. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they may be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his leg. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he, and he that saw it bare a record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith what he saith is true, that he might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, They shall look upon him whom they pierce. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. And he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, who was at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes about a hundred pound weight. Then they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bear. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never a man laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh him. You want to pray? Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this word mm. as it is given today. We thank you for the greatest gift that you could ever give us. The mm. gift that Jesus Christ has offered to us of eternity in his presence. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. And as we soon, either we wait, we soon return. Lift up our heads and look up. We know the word that our Redeemer draws nigh. Mm. Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Kenny. Appreciate you doing that. Well, as you saw, I hope your Bibles are open to John chapter 19. And this is going to conclude John chapter 19 for us. And again, we're moving forward through the, the gospel of John. But to me, when we come to this section, John chapter 19, beginning in verse where we're at, uh, verse 31, and then moving on through verse 42. And quite frankly, through chapter 20 as well, to me, it begins the portion that, that I've just kind of called the gospel portion of the gospel of John. And what I mean by that is, is the gospel. And what is the gospel? And we try to make that very, very clear over and over again what it is. Because to know what it is, is to be able to proclaim what it is. And Paul talks very clearly that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And I like to also add to that, not adding to Paul, but, but clarifying to that, is that also how man fits into that. That we need to understand that, yes, Jesus Christ died, was buried, was raised from the dead. But mankind, human beings, fit into this. We have to benefit from this somehow. It's not that we just kind of set it aside and say, hey, that's the gospel. It, it's not in a universal sense that even though Jesus paid the, cro- uh, the, the price on the cross, not everybody's going to heaven because he did that. We have to appropriate that in our lives. We have to trust in that. So we come to this section that, that I look at as, as the gospel portion of this gospel. And I thought about this, and I thought about the resurrection. And as we look at the resurrection, if the resurrection would be considered like the door that might swing open to eternal life, that brings us and ushers us into the kingdom of heaven, if that's the case, then the hinge on which this door swings is the death. Of Christ, Because without the death, there is no resurrection. And so as we go through this, and I appreciate you, Kenny, reading the scripture, we're going to look at three things from this. We're going to see out of this, number one, that the death was real. Not only that, we're going to see that the death fulfilled. It fulfilled specific things that were, we see in our scripture text, but things that we don't, things that Jesus said. But also we're going to see, finally, what the death killed. Because the death of Jesus did kill something. That we all have to benefit from through faith. You guys like uh, Little House on the Prairie? Anybody ever watch Little House on the Prairie? 
I like Little House on the Prairie. I've always liked Little House on the Prairie since I was a kid. And I was watching an episode of it. I think it, it had to have been the second or third episode. I was watching it this week with my mom. And in it, it was kind of interesting. I thought about this in a, in a great way. This, this, what I'm getting for this is, is be very careful where you get your theology from. Don't get your theology from Little House on the Prairie because um, we want to get our theology from the scriptures. We want to get our theology from what, what the scripture, the, the doctrine, the teachings in the Bible. I was watching Little House on the Prairie and it was, it was the episode, you may have seen it, where, where Charles is, they're new to the area. He's got to plow the field. He doesn't have a plow. He doesn't have seed and he doesn't have money. So he kind of makes some deals and he's doing some bartering. He'll do some work at the, I think at the mill. He'll do some repair work and he'll get all this stuff. And he's just working himself to death. Well, Sunday rolls around and Laura's like, it's the Lord's day. And Charles is putting on his tie. And the next thing you know, uh, Carolyn looks and he's asleep. He's just knocked out. He's wiped out. He can't go to church. So they go to church and the pastor's there and he looks over everybody. It's kind of ironic. He looks over everybody. He sees how many people are not there. And he sees how many women are not there with their husbands. And, and then he says something that was very interesting. And I, I, I'm sure as a kid I never took notice of this. But I did on this one. And I gave my mom a little theological lesson on this. Not that she needed it, but she got it anyway. The, the preacher stands up and he says, you know, the thing about it is uh, we need to be constantly forgiven of our sins to get to heaven. And we do that in church. So basically, if you're not in church, you're not going to heaven. I thought, wow, uh, man, that'll pack them in. That's kind of a, a good message if you want people in church on Sunday. But it doesn't really hold true theologically, biblically. That's not, that's not what happens. It's through the death of Christ and the shedding of his blood that we have remission of, of sins. We have forgiveness. We have cleansing, all of these things. And, and granted, when we do sin as Christians, we want to ask forgiveness from God, but that's affecting our fellowship. It's not affecting heaven. If we've come to faith in Christ, then we are children of God. We are citizens of the kingdom. And, and quite frankly, yeah, do I want to see people in church? You bet. But I'm not going to throw that out there, that if you don't come to church, you're going to hell. <laughs> That's just not biblical. And we got to be very, very careful where we get our theology from because chances are, and, and I want to be careful with this too, there may have been people who saw that and have seen that and thought, wow, yeah, amen to that. Not amen to that. Our, our theology of salvation and the doctrine of salvation comes through the gospel, through the death of Christ, and through the death comes the burial, and from the burial comes forth the resurrection. So that's what we're getting into today. So the death was real, the death fulfilled, and the death killed. So let's first look, and we're not going to break this down like I normally do verse by verse. We're just going to take things from what Kenny read. So first, let's look at the death was real. Now, where we left Jesus last week in verse 30, is when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And we won't rehash that again, but we understand what that means. It was finished. Everything was fulfilled that needed to be. And then he bowed his head, and, he, and I like this. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He gave it up. Remember, nobody took his life from him. He laid it down. And he was laying it down as an offering. But then we come to verse 31. And it talks about the day of preparation and that day of preparation. Here's what was happening in the lives of the Jewish nation is that the Sabbath was drawing near. The sun was beginning to set. So that marked the beginning of the Sabbath. And it wasn't just a normal Sabbath. It was a, a high Sabbath or a very important Sabbath that was taking place during the Passover. So even that was, was something that the Jewish people had to make sure that they were in a position to, to acknowledge the Sabbath and they weren't able to do certain things. And so they had to make sure, and this is the Jewish people that wanted Jesus crucified. So they recognized that the preparation is coming and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross during the Sabbath or this high day. They couldn't be there. And it's so ironic and it's so easy to pass over this. Because what they're doing is they're trying to hold to the law. Because the law says in the nation of Israel that if somebody's crucified or somebody is hung on a tree, you cannot leave them there overnight. You've got to take care of that. You don't want to defile the land. Do you see the hypocrisy in this? They have put the Son of God who came only healing and forgiving sins and raising the dead and doing all of the things that the Messiah was supposed to do. And they choose to ignore that. Or reject that and crucify him. But yet they want to hold to the law. Oh, we got to hold to the Sabbath. 
And they'd already tried to corner Jesus in with the Sabbath when he and his disciples walked through the fields. Remember what they did? They were grabbing the grain and, and they were basically threshing. They were, they were rubbing it on their hands, blowing away the chaff and eating it because they were hungry. And those Judaizers, or not necessarily Judaizers, but, but the, the, the ones that were there, the Pharisees, they were watching the law, they were watching Jesus and they came up to him and they said, ah, you're breaking the Sabbath. You're basically threshing on the Sabbath. I mean, this is all they were doing. And they said, you're breaking the law of the Sabbath. And that's when Jesus says, remember this. The Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. And that's a very important aspect because who is Lord of the Sabbath? It's Jesus. So we see that the Jews here, they're trying to hold to the Sabbath law here. They've got to make sure that these Jewish men that were crucified, they got to be dead. Because they got to get off the cross because nothing. And here's the thing. The, the Romans, as they would crucify people, they would sometimes leave people on the cross for days. But the Jewish people wanted to honor this high day, this high Sabbath, and get them off the cross. So they had to be dead. And so to, to accelerate, because remember, again, if you know anything about crucifixions, they could last for days. It was a slow, slow, torturous process. So again, where the arms are outstretched to the point of where you're basically only able to exhale and to get a breath, you have to pull and push yourself up through hands that have nails and feet that are that are nailed to the cross just to breathe. So basically what's happening and we'll get a little more into this, but but carbon dioxide is building up. So with each breath, it's excruciating. So how do you accelerate this? How do you how do you bring forth death in a quicker manner? You break their legs. If you go and break their legs, then they can't push up. So all of the forces on the hands or through the wrists to get even just a single breath to the point where your breaths are getting shallower and shallower and shallower and you ultimately suffocate and you die. And so the Jewish people, look at what they do. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. And again, it's all because of Sabbath. We've got to hold to the law. But they've crucified the Son of God. They've crucified their Messiah. So here's the thing that I want us to recognize, that one evidence that the death is real is because the the Romans, while they didn't begin crucifixion, they had perfected crucifixion. The Romans perfected death, and the Jewish people, through crucifixion, expected death. So remember that. It wasn't just that somebody was nailed on the cross and held there for a few days, and okay, you've suffered enough, we'll let you down, you can walk home. It was death. And so the Jews wanted legs broken to bring forth death. So there's one evidence that the death of Jesus on the cross would have been real. But then look in verse 33. Verse 33, when they came to Jesus, because they break the two thieves, they break their legs. And then they come to Jesus and they're ready to break his legs. But it says when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead. So here's another proof of evidence that the death was real. Roman soldiers knew death. That was their business, be it on the battlefield, but certainly those who crucified, they understood death. Can you imagine what would happen to them if they crucify someone for a crime against Rome and then they pull that person down off the cross and they're not dead? They would die. They understood death. They knew that he was dead. So they come to Jesus and I think they're a little shocked that he was dead already. But again, we need to remember all that Jesus had been through prior to this point. Go back to the Garden of Gethsemane. Go back to the, to the oil press that was upon him. Remember that he's sweating drops of blood. All of that's building upon him. The floggings that took place, the blood loss, the shock, all of this stuff, the carrying of his cross. It shouldn't surprise us one bit that he was already dead on the cross. But the Romans, it seems that they were, they were ready to break his legs so he wouldn't be able to breathe, to accelerate his death, but he was already dead. So there's another evidence of that. They come to break him, they don't break his legs because he's dead. But then in verse 34, if that wasn't enough evidence that the death was real, but one of the soldiers, just to make sure, we got to make sure this guy needs to die. We can't mess this up. The other ones, their legs are broken, so we know they're not breathing. We know their, their minutes are numbered. This guy's dead. We don't see him breathing. He's hanging there. But just to make sure, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once, there came out blood and water. And I think it's, it's I don't know if it's necessarily easy, and I don't necessarily know if it's wrong to spiritualize the blood and the water, but I'm not going to do that. 
Because basically what would have happened as Jesus, and this is more of a medical sort of way to look at the crucifixion, as he's unable to breathe, he's unable to to exhale anymore, and his body is filling up with carbon dioxide, what's going to happen is his lungs are going to fill up, and water is going to also fill up around his heart. So that, that part from a medical aspect would have taken place in Jesus. And so when I see this, and I think the main part of what John is saying here is one of the soldiers pierced his side, and at once blood and water came out. Look at what he says in verse 35. And he who saw it, born witness. John is describing himself. John here is a witness to what took place. He's not trying to be a doctor. And I don't necessarily think he's, he's trying to spiritualize it. He saw Jesus die. Remember, he stood there. He was given Mary, and Mary was given to him. And he saw that Jesus had given up his spirit. He witnessed that. He knew he was dead. And then he saw that the other criminals, were, were their legs were broken. And he saw that a, that a soldier went up and jabbed a spear through the ribs of Jesus. And what flowed out? Blood and water. And that's exactly what should have happened if his lung was pierced and it pierced into his heart. That's exactly what would have happened, proving the fact that there was that that aspect of fluid around the heart and fluid in the lungs because he died a real death. And John is saying this and he's given testimony just as an eyewitness here. He's saying, he who saw it, speaking of himself, he's bearing witness. He's saying, my testimony is true. And I know that I'm telling the truth. And I know that Jesus really died on that cross. The death was real. That's ultimately what John was saying. He's not giving a second-hand witness of an, of an account. He's seen it firsthand. He saw Jesus. He knew he was dead. He witnessed this. And again, this goes back to those, those opponents of the crucifixion of the gospel that say, well, Jesus didn't really die. We really did die. The Romans testified to the fact that he died. John, the beloved disciple, he loved Jesus. He didn't want Jesus to die. He's testifying. He's testifying in two ways. He's testifying, first off, that he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. He saw that. But he's also testifying that he saw with his own eyes a Roman spear go up and puncture through his ribs. And he wasn't a doctor. He didn't understand all that we understand today. But he saw blood and he saw water. And that was true evidence that Jesus, in his humanity, really died. John is bearing witness to this as one who saw it flow out. But if that's not enough evidence to show you that the death was real, he says, "For these, well, I'm going to skip down from that. Verse 38, after these things, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. Pilate's not going to give permission to Joseph to take down a body from a cross that isn't really dead. He had to be dead. You have to be dead to take this body. And not only did he just take the body, what did he want to do with the body? He wants to bury the body. These disciples were not going to take Jesus if there was even just the smallest evidence that he was still alive. They weren't going to bury him. That's absurd to think that. They didn't want him to die. They loved him. But then to add to that, you see Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, what a great re-entry into the story of Nicodemus. You know Nicodemus from John chapter 3. We know Nicodemus is a Pharisee. We know that he came to Jesus through night. We know that he had all of these questions. And we know that he heard from the mouth of our Lord that, hey, Nicodemus, it's great that you're a teacher of Israel. But you ought to know these things. That if you want to get into heaven, you want to have eternal life, you must be born again. Well, I tend to think that this is great evidence that that's exactly what happened to Nicodemus. Because he's no longer afraid. He's no longer coming at night. He's coming out in broad daylight where the body of Jesus is being taken down from a cross. And he's got all of this myrrh and he's got aloe. And it may be 75 pounds. The Roman may have 100 pounds. But regardless, I want you to think about this. Matt, I was thinking about this this morning. And, and maybe, maybe I'm, I know it, but I want to make sure. How much does a, pot, or does, a, does a bag of sack creek weigh, roughly? 60 or 80 pound bags. Anybody ever lifted one of those? How heavy is that? Oh, it's pretty heavy. So that's putting us right in the range that Nicodemus is carrying of myrrh and aloe. Now myrrh, it was a, it was a strong smelling thing that would have covered up the scent of death. 
And they think that maybe the aloe was used to kind of allow the myrrh to stay on sort of as, a, as an agent to, to kind of rub on there and then sort of keep it on the body so it wouldn't just fall off. But regardless of what the reasoning was, myrrh and aloe was brought, many pounds of it, by Nicodemus to a dead body. To a dead body. He wouldn't have brought this to a body that really wasn't dead. And so again, more evidence from Nicodemus that the death of Jesus was real. So they take him and they they bound him in linen cloths and they put the spices on and then they bury him, which is the custom of the Jews. Remember, this culture understood death. They saw it all the time. It was was a hands-on kind of thing. They didn't have funeral homes like we have. They had to take care of their own family in death. So they understood when somebody was dead, they knew it. And so again, the evidence is mounting that Jesus is really dead. And they take him in the garden, is nearby. There's a tomb. It's a new tomb. Nobody's been placed in this tomb before because sometimes there were multiple bodies in there. Sometimes they would go back and take the bones out and put them in an ossuary. A lot of things were happening, but this was a new garden tomb. Nobody had ever used it before. It says in verse 42, So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. You don't lay living people In a tomb. The death was real. The body placed in the tomb. A real body that was flesh and bones. But yet still containing the tabernacling aspect of God in the flesh. Condescending with man. Dwelling among us. They place a dead body in a tomb. Because indeed the death was real. But now let's switch to the next one. See what the death fulfilled. I'm not going to turn to all of these, but in every single gospel, there were times when Jesus predicted his death as he drew closer and closer to the time of going into Jerusalem. You can mark these. You can turn there really fast if you want to. But Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 21, Jesus predicts his death. Mark chapter 9, verse 30, beginning in verse 30, verses 30 and 32, he again predicts his death. Luke chapter 9. Verses 22 through 27, Jesus again predicts his death. And my favorite, and this is in John chapter 12, and you may not think, well, this isn't really a prediction of his death, but I think it is. I think it's very, very solid of a prediction of his death. John chapter 12, verse 24, where Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Who is he talking about there? He's talking about himself. He's talking about the fact that he must die on the cross because in that, if he doesn't die, there's no burial, there's no resurrection, there's no atonement for sin, there's no cleansing of sin. So he's making these predictions about his death that in we understand in the fact that in verse 30 that he bows his head and gave up his spirit and we're seeing all the evidence that it was real, it is fulfilled. Look at verse 36. Verse 36 says, For again, these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. So we're seeing a fulfillment aspect of prophecy, Old Testament prophecy, that not one of his bones would be broken. Now you may think, well, that's okay, they weren't broken because, because he was already dead and they didn't have to break his bones and accelerate death. Well, yeah, that's, that's on the surface. But you go to Exodus chapter 12, verse 46, and I will turn there real quick because I want you to read this. And it's also, again, relayed in Numbers, Numbers chapter 9, but Exodus chapter 12, verse 46 says this. And speaking of the Passover and the institution of it, it shall be eaten, speaking of the Passover lamb, in one house, and you shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. Remember this about the Passover, and this is, this is something very crucial to get, and I repeat it often because I don't want us to ever forget this. The Passover is the shadow of the substance of the death of Christ. Now, you may think, wait a minute, Passover came way before the death of Christ. That's true. But it's a shadow that if you see what was taking place in the Old Testament, in the Exodus, and the years where it was done properly, when you follow that shadow, you're going to come to the substance that this shadow is leading us to. That's the death of Jesus. It's not the other way around. You don't look at the Passover and see that as the main object that's casting a shadow. And within that shadow, it ends with Jesus' death. It's the other way around. Because all of these things are pointing the Jewish people to the fact that your sins must be atoned for. 
There will be death. There will be the shedding of blood in even the aspect of a lamb, which we go to John the Baptist as he sees Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't say the picture of a Lamb of God or the shadow of a Lamb of God. What does he call Jesus? The Lamb of God. The fulfillment of all of those times when the nation of Israel saw those lambs sacrificed on the Passover and even the Day of Atonement and all of these things, they find their fulfillment in Jesus. He is the substance. So we see that John brings this out. And he looks at what happened in Jesus, the fulfillment of that prophecy, that not one of his bones would be broken. That not one of the bones of that sacrificial lamb during the Passover time would have his bones broken. It's interesting because the Romans just didn't break his bones because he was already dead. But again, we're seeing prophecy fulfilled, which shows us who's in control of this situation. It's God. All of this is ordained by God. Jesus is the one who gives up his spirit. He lays down his life. All of these things are happening. But then in verse 37, we see again the death fulfilled. Not just that the prophecy of his bones are not being broken, but in verse 37, again, the scripture, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Let me read that to you. Zechariah chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 10 says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. That when they look on me, now listen to this, when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Now, in real time, they're looking as they see Jesus crucified. They're looking upon him whom they have pierced, but they're not seeing him as the son of God. But if you come all the way to the end of the book, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. And look in Revelation 1, 7. And again, who wrote the book of Revelation? It was John. And this is what he says in this. He says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. There will be that fulfillment, that aspect. And I think that within... And and I think I'm okay with saying this. We are seeing, I believe, a time where the Jewish people are coming to faith in Christ. And when you come to faith in Christ, what are you doing? You're looking upon him whom you've pierced. Because why did he die? Who pierced him? And that was the big debate. Remember when the movie Passion of the Christ came out? And everybody was in just uproar and it was, you know, they were just trying to destroy this movie. Well, it, it's anti-Semitic saying the Jews crucified him. Well, no, it was the Romans who crucified him. Wipe all that away. I crucified him. You crucified him. When we stop battling over whether it was Greeks or, or Gentiles or Romans or, or Jewish people, we, you and I, our sins, that's why he died. That's why he was crucified. So if anybody comes to faith in Christ, it's because we have looked upon whom we have pierced. He took our place. It's our substitute. It's his death. Sinless, though taking all of our sin upon him, all of God's wrath upon him, dying on the cross for us, being buried, raised from the dead. There's the gospel. That's the reality of what was happening on the cross. And it's not your reality unless you reach out in faith. Please understand that. Unless you reach out and take hold of it and you rest your soul upon the gospel of Christ, which you can't separate Jesus from the gospel. They are so intimately intertwined. Unless you trust in Jesus, you have no place in the gospel. And that's a harsh thing to to realize and recognize because there are stores and houses and resorts today at this moment filled with people who at this point have no part in the gospel of Christ. They have no forgiveness of sins. We need to pray for those people. We need to pray. And I believe it. I believe that there are those who are not yet of the fold, who have not yet heard the voice of the shepherd, but they're going to hear it and they're going to respond. But we need to pray for those people. We need to pray for the lost, that they as well and the Jewish people would look upon whom they have pierced and place their faith in him. But a final thing that, that the death fulfilled is that Jesus being placed in the tomb. 
You may think, okay, yeah, dead people placed in the tomb. Where's the fulfillment of prophecy in that? Look back in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 50, or chapter 52 and going through verse 53. Powerful, powerful things in reference to Jesus and his death. But specifically, chapter 53, verse 9 speaks of this some 700 years before Christ was born and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. That's a fulfillment of prophecy that Joseph Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich man, who had a tomb of his own, a brand new tomb, and Jesus is placed in that. So even the placing of Jesus in the tomb, we see that the death fulfilled prophecy. But finally, I want us to see, what did the death kill? That may not make sense, and that may seem really strange. And, and there's a book, there's a book by the Puritan pastor, John Owen, that I've got in the library, in my library. If anybody wants to read it, I'll let you read it. It's a powerful book. It's about 319 pages long, written in the smallest absolute print you can imagine. And it is entitled, The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. And that's not a redundant statement. Now, it deals specifically with the atonement and what what happened in the death of Christ. But what did the death of Jesus kill? It killed something. Let me start off with this. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. We understand that. We know that scripture. Well, if the wages of sin is death and we've all sinned, then there's a payment coming our way that we deserve. Just like when you work a full week of work, you get a paycheck, you've earned that. Well, we have earned death. However, through Christ, who never earned that paycheck of death, took it upon himself to die in our place. Therefore, his death killed the wages of our sin, which is our own death. And I don't mean physical, but I mean the second death. Eternal punishment. The death of death, the death of Jesus killed the wages of our sin, which is death. But also in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, we realize and we read that we all, before Christ, were dead in our trespasses and sins. Dead in that, which means that we weren't alive to God. And what I mean by that is that doesn't mean God didn't know who you were. That doesn't mean he's not your creator. That doesn't mean that you were not made in his image. But it means that you are separated from him. Every single one of us before Christ have been separated from our Father. And if we die in that state then we'll be eternally separated from him in what's made reference to by the Apostle Paul, but also in the book of Revelation, as the second death. That's a tragedy upon tragedy. I hate death. I hate physical death. I see what it robs. I know what it does. But to die in the physical and then to die, I want to be careful with this, to be in a state of dying eternally in hell. Because those who are in hell, those who have rejected Christ in the gospel, they're in a state of death. They're in perpetual dying, but you never reach to that point where you're dying because when you die, the pain ends. The suffering ends. It will never end in hell. It's a perpetual, eternal aspect of it. But here's the reality. For us in Christ, the death of Jesus killed the second death for us. It's dead. The death of death. And the death of Christ has been taken care of. And then Paul also says, what is the last enemy to be killed? Death. So the death of Jesus also killed the death, which is our last enemy. All of these things were done. This is what the death killed for us. But yet you don't own it. It's not yours unless you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Unless you have absolutely trusted in him. You believe that his death on the cross is the death for your sins. That it did pay the wages of your sin, which is your death. That it did pay for the death that you were in in trespasses prior to knowing him. That it did in full pay the payment necessary so that you can be delivered from second death. And that final enemy, death, paid in full by Jesus through his death. Now I want you to think on this. How has the death of Jesus impacted you? Because I, I pray that it has. Number one, is it real to you? Do you believe it? Because if you don't believe the death, if you don't believe that he really died, there's no way you're going to believe that he was raised from the dead. No way. He really, really did die. And I've shared that testimony of my own prior years before coming to faith in Christ. I rejected his death. I'd read somewhere a swooning effect. I said, oh yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) The most ignorant, ignorant thing that is out there. 
That a man can, can truly, and there's testimony, extra biblical testimony, that Jesus was really crucified. That a man can have nails driven through his hands and his feet and lose all of that blood and be taken down, placed in a tomb, have a stone rolled there, and that he can revive, be revived in there from all the blood loss, push that stone away, and walk out. That's absurd. That's ignorant. People think, oh, to believe in the resurrection is foolishness. It's more foolish to believe something like that than it is to believe in the resurrection. But again, to start with, you've got to believe in the death. Do you believe that it's real? You need to. Do you believe, do you see it as a fulfillment? Because it fulfilled prophecy. It fulfilled, we see it there. We see three aspects of prophecy, but there's more. That's what Jesus' death did. It fulfilled something. But finally, did the death of Jesus, did it kill your death? Because if it didn't, then you will own that death. And what I mean by that is the second death. You will own the punishment that he already paid for on the cross. You will own it. And you will be in a perpetual state of punishment. Never ever reaching its end. Never reaching a satisfaction of that wrath that's been poured out by God because God is holy. But on the cross, God was satisfied. That's where I get that word. Anybody familiar with that word propitiation? It's a biblical word. But it deals with the fact that Jesus' blood was shed. It deals with atonement. But it also deals with the fact that God was satisfied. His wrath was satisfied. That's why I always say, if we've come to faith in Christ, there is no hidden vial of wrath behind God's back that he's waiting to just pour out upon you because all your sins weren't dealt with on the cross. They were. Full atonement through the blood of Christ. The death of death by the death of Christ. That's what he did for us. I pray that we've all trusted in that. We need to. We need to reach out in faith because here it is sitting right before you. God's grace extended to you. It is finished. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your death. We recognize what the death means. That it was real, Jesus. You really, really, really died. But in your death, there were such prophetic things utterings, scriptures fulfill Jesus in your death and we praise you for that. That reminds us, God, that this is part of the plan. This wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a mix-up. It wasn't a reaction. There was no other way. But Jesus, what your death killed on our behalf, that's why we'll be worshiping you for all eternity because we don't belong there. But through your death, You've killed death for us. You've washed away our sins. You've cleansed us. You've you've sacrificed yourself. You have satisfied the wrath of God so that we will be forever in your presence. So we'll be reunited with the Father. We'll be worshiping a triune God. And forever we'll be with you, Jesus. So we praise you for that. And I pray everybody that's here, everybody that hears this message, God, that they have trusted in your death, Jesus. And I praise you because, Lord willing, as we continue to progress through the Gospel of John, we come to the resurrection. We praise you now for the resurrection. That's why we gathered on this day, Jesus, in worship of you, because you live. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Father, for demonstrating your love for us and that while we were yet sinners, your enemies, your son, the Messiah died for us. Thank you, Father. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.